Hello, everyone. My name is Philip Palumbo, host of the Palumbo Post, where we interview some of the most prominent portfolio managers, economists, market strategists to get their insights on their particular specialty. Today, I'm super excited to have Mark to rest with me, who's senior portfolio manager on the Alpha Centric LifeSide Fund. Uh, Mark has 16 years experience in the business of managing money, specifically in the biotech area. He's just written up in Barron's, his particular fund, as number one biotech fund. And he's currently the founding partner of LifeSci uh, Fund Management. So we're super excited to have you here, Mark. Thank you for your time today. Yeah, th thanks, Phil. Really appreciate um, the invitation and good to be with you. All right, great. So, Mark, I'd love to start off with just telling our audience a little bit about your background. Where did you go to school, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'm a scientist by training, Phil. And before I got into managing money, you know, I worked as a scientist at a big pharma company. So I, I got my undergraduate degree at Rutgers University in chemistry. And then I went on to Harvard and got a PhD in chemistry and chemical biology and actually started my professional career, you know, ma managing a medicinal chemistry lab at uh, Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research in Cambridge, Mass. So how did you go from the medical field and then wanting to get into investment management? How did that even work? Yeah, no, it was an interesting path. I mean, it, so it turned it out that, um, you know, my graduate work turned into uh, a company and ultimately, you know, is translated into um, a program that got a drug approved uh, by FDA. So it was pretty exciting to, to see that process. And I think as I watched it, that process unfold, I became much more interested in, you know, understanding the translation of science to, you know, into a real commercial entity, you know, how do you actually make a drug that that helps patients? And, you know, it turns out that, you know, the enterprise of doing that requires a lot of work, um, you know, on the corporate side, and, and, you know, certainly understanding how these programs are funded, and that opened the whole can of worms that sort of led me to a career in uh, investment management focused in uh, therapeutic companies. So this background that you have, right, from what you studied in, in school to investment management, how does that help you? How does that help you? Because it obviously has worked with you know, the number one biotech fund that's out there right now, just written by Barron's. So how have you taken your, your knowledge, your experience, and, and, and really moved it toward the investment field and, and proliferated as you, as, as you have? Yeah, Phil. So you know, we approach you know uh, investing you know from a scientific orientation. So we're a fundamental, bottoms up, thesis driven investment manager, and you know we like to roll up our sleeves, as we say, and really get into you know the basic science, understand the mechanism. You know, if we're investing in therapeutics companies, you know the the fundamentals for a therapeutic company, Phil. It, it's well beyond, you know, traditional fundamentals as folks think about it, you know, that they might find in, you know, a Bloomberg terminal looking at company financials, et cetera. Uh, in, in order to be have develop a successful biotechnology product or therapeutic drug, you know, you really have to have a differentiated mechanism mechanism of action, uh, a differentiated um, a context to apply it in a clinical setting. So what particular patients are you treating? You know, what's the what's the um, the alternative treatments for those patients? Um, you know, what is the reimbursement landscape going to be? If, assuming the drugs approved, what's the regulatory approval path? Um, the manufacturing, you know, particularly if it's a complex, you know, large molecule or something. So intellectual property, I can go on and on, but I think you get a sense that you know, there's a lot of, you know, individual complex topics that all need to converge uh, in, in order to, you know, identify, uh, you know, a compelling drug opportunity. And, and we think you have to have some technical experience and training in order to unpack all of that um, and sort of really separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Which is the reason why my firm has been talking to you, because we realize that, hey, we can pick the Pfizer's of the world and Johnson Johnson's of the world, which I'll talk about in a moment. But we know that you definitely have a, have a specific specialty and skill set you know, really to understand that industry to create alpha above and beyond the the particular category or even the market in general. So so that's that's super, super helpful. And when we spoke to you, we felt like your knowledge and background, you know, was really well suited. So when you think about the healthcare space, right? So the Barron's article is about biotech. We really are looking more for managers that specialize in biotech. Would you consider your fund a healthcare fund, a biotech fund? What's the difference? Help educate my audience about what the difference is exactly. Yeah, I think when people talk about healthcare, Phil, they, you know, they they have 
maybe a more broad encompassing definition uh, definition that includes you know sort of some of the s p 500 industrial uh, healthcare companies so you know the large managed care companies you know united health of the world humanas etc you know the large hospital systems um you know medical devices and then you know there's pharmaceuticals and biotech you know sort of in that bucket you know i, I think um you know we we run an unconstrained strategy phil that you know, it can invest across healthcare, but we specialize in therapeutics, you know, given sort of our backgrounds and technical training and, and also the fact that, you know, we find uh, the, ther the therapeutic space oftenly has, you know, the largest number of mispriced assets, um, you know, both being, you know, too richly valued or, or you know, sort of, um, you know, baby thrown out with the bathwater type situation. So, you know, we tend to invest mostly in therapeutics uh, because, again, that's where we find, you know, a disconnect between uh, the value of market, the market might be pricing on an asset and what we think the intrinsic fair value is or its potential. Uh, but we will opportunistically invest across the whole healthcare ecosystem uh, because, you know, there, there are compelling opportunities across the whole space. And, and we think if you're paying attention uh, over time, you can capture them. Out of all the different spaces, managed care, pharmaceutical, and biotech, but first let me ask you, the therapeutics, right? You would categorize that in what particular category? Biotech? Yeah, I, I think you could say, I, I, I often use the word um, uh, disruptive life sciences innovators or the phrase disruptive life sciences innovators. So I think that's maybe a, a, a more fair and accurate description. I think, you know, biotech is encompassed within that definition, but I think that definition maybe is, is you know, a slightly broader uh, way to describe it. But you think about it, maybe if I were to describe it from a, you know, what, what these drugs actually do perspective, I would say, you know, differentiated therapeutics that meet critical unmet medical needs, right? So, right. And when you use the word therapeutics, give us an, give me an example of a company that offers therapeutics um, so the audience understands that specifically. Yeah, so it could be any new drug, um, you know, so I, I would, you know, it could be, a, you know, a large company, you know, you mentioned Pfizer, right, you know, Pfizer developed, um, you know, an oral antiviral therapeutic for, you know, COVID, right, Paxlovid, mm -hmm. um, that's a well-known example, and then there are some small cap companies, so like a 270 Bio, um, they just actually did a, a financing transaction recently, but they have a, um, a BCMA-focused uh, CAR-T therapy for uh, late line multiple myeloma patients. Um, it's a very interesting drug. It's a complex biologic. It's a cell therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's partnered with Bristol Myers and it's, you know, it's going to do five, six hundred million dollars revenue this year. So, you know, it, it's a pretty broad spectrum. So, Mark, when you're a field, when you're out there looking to invest capital in a certain asset, is what percent of what you do is investing in a company based on an approval from the FDA? Yeah, well, I mean, we're operating in regulated markets, Phil, right? So, you know, every branded pharmaceutical product that wants to access the market needs to go through a regulatory approval process. So, um, you know, every new program, you have to pay attention to what the regulatory path is. And, you know, I, I think where folks get tripped up is a lot of folks think of FDA as being a monolith of, uh, you know, of bureaucracy, it's actually made up of individual divisions that can behave very differently from each other. And so depending upon the type of drug and the indication it's going after, you know, the regulatory hurdle might be very different. So, you know, just give you two examples, right? So, you know, a late stage oncology drug, a breakthrough oncology drug that's for patients that have no therapeutic alternatives, you know, sort of like the 270 drug I mentioned a moment ago, right. you know, something like that, is going to have a very different regulatory hurdle and in, in review process than, you know, another, you know, hypertension or lipid lowering drug where, you know, there are many therapeutic alternatives. Those are, you know, typically slow progressing diseases that, you know, have severe consequences over many years or decades. Uh, but, you know, the bar for demonstrating safety and efficacy is much higher, right? So, you know, maybe those are two extreme goalposts, but hopefully that gives you a flavor of, you know, the dispersion. And maybe the last thought on this is that, you know, it, it means that each individual program, you have to evaluate each individual program on its own merits in the context of the severity of the disease, the number of patients that might be exposed and the therapeutic alternatives those patients might have access to. So it, you know, I think you start to get a sense for, you know, what I was trying to describe earlier about fundamentals and, you know, the fundamentals here, again, broader than, you know, just financial metrics, all of these aspects of, of, of you know, uh, these drug programs matter um, and particularly in a regulatory context. From a regulatory standpoint, are there statistics out there? I mean, I remember listening to multiple podcasts about FDA approval of drugs, et cetera, and 
as I understand it, 90% of drugs do not get approved, mainly because of risk factors to, to humans, right, when ingesting them through, through the various studies that they go through. Is that accurate? Yeah, so I think it depends on, on where you where you start counting from, right? So if you start counting from, you know, all the drugs that enter human testing and the percentage that ultimately get approved, yeah, that's a, a relatively low percentage. But, you, you you know, I've seen some other studies and, you know, we've done some of our own analyses that that parse out the types of programs, right? So I'll give you an example. So programs that are really focused on precise molecular targets, that very well-defined, you know, disease biology, you know, programs that that have those characteristics and more modern programs within the past, say, five, seven years um, have much higher success rates. So, so again, it, it's, it, it's sort of like we were describing, Phil, with, with um, you know, FDA not being a monolith. Programs are not created equally, right? And right. and so here's the opportunity for an active, you know, fundamental investor in this space is that you know we feel like we can look at you know a hundred programs that might be in early stage development. Fifty of them we might think are are you know very high risk, low probability. We're going to ignore those, and of the other fifty, we're going to roll up our sleeves and really try to get to what are the ten best. Which is really what I was going to ask you next. So that's how that process works, huh? So when you think about you investing in, in certain investments, you'll go through all these. If you'll source ideas of various companies that are looking to get certain drugs approved. And the ones that you feel that have the highest chance of getting approval are some of the investments that you may make. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and maybe, you know, I, I sort of danced around it, but maybe to say it very directly, Phil, is that the probability of success of each individual program is, is highly disparate. Right. And, and we feel that, you know, you can actually, through careful review of, of the, you know, the science behind the programs um, and the regulatory path and some of the things we we're talking about, we feel like, you know, as an investor, you can enrich a portfolio for programs that are more likely to succeed than not. And so it's, it's not, so I, you know, I think a bad strategy is actually trying to own an equal weight uh, portfolio of every product that's out there. Cause um, you know, you might be shocked to hear that that strategy, you know, will lose money over time. So if you look at, um, uh, uh, IPO statistics. So um, uh, the 2020 class of IPOs, 2021, et cetera. Um, and you can go back and do this year by year. If you look at um, the the performance of the IPO classes over time, what you'll see is the results are not normally distributed. You'll see um, uh, the, um, the median performance being highly negative, but the mean performance in off is often positive. Well, how is that yeah. possible? Well, there's a handful of winners, right? And the, so the companies that have successful programs, uh, you know, are the big winners and they create fantastic returns for shareholders. Right. You know, the, the most of the programs that, you know, most of them don't, don't make it over the goal line, right? So they right. fail and right. all those companies destroy equity value, Phil, right? right? So you don't want to own the average company in this space. You really got to own the best companies. And that's, and that's obviously the main trick. So when, when, you, when you have an idea that you sourced, and you did your research, you rolled up your sleeves, like you said before, right? High probability that you believe will get approval from FDA, which is going to be critical to the increase in shareholder value. What percent of your fund will you invest in that particular investment? Yeah, so for the, for, you know, talk about the mutual fund, right? So that's that's publicly traded. So yes. that's, a, you know, a 50 stock portfolio. You know, we typically have about a 500 basis point exposure limit for any individual company. Uh, in that particular portfolio, mm -hmm. you know, I think in a, you know, in a private portfolio, which, you know, we're, we, we have some uh, private managed accounts, you know, we can go higher than that. Uh, but, you know, I think how, high, how, high, how, high, how high will you go in the private stuff? Yeah, I think you can get 10 plus 10, 15%. Wow. So you make, you'll make some big bets in those areas. Yeah. Yeah. Now the bar is very high for that. Right. And and that's not the right. typical bet. Right. Um, and, and, you know, usually if you're going to have exposure at that level, um, it, it would, it would be, uh, you know, with a lot of proof points in hand, you probably would have yeah. to already have very compelling data, you know, a, a compelling safety database, you know, maybe already an approval in hand, maybe it's funding the growth equity stage of, of the story. Um, the valuation that you acquired that position at would have to be very discounted to your belief of what the fair value of the asset was. So a lot of things would have to line up. That's not, I would say that's not the, the typical positioning, but uh, you know, when all the things line up, Phil, and conviction is there, absolutely. And so, so most of your investing mark is, is around this idea of waiting for companies to go through the FDA approval process that your highest conviction ideas, that's mostly how you invest or 
do you look at like for example Pfizer today, right? So Pfizer we know is trading at really way well in my view, you know, well below the book value, cash flows. I mean, they're high because what you know, if you look at the past 12 months because of COVID vaccine, but that's going to dissipate. But the high returns on investment capital, it's a great business, strong pipeline, good management. But Pfizer's down in value, right? So is that something that you'll invest in? I mean, not just Pfizer, many businesses in healthcare right now are down a lot. Will, will you also will it also be about looking at opportunities that are are companies that are trading below intrinsic value based on just purely valuations as that sector has gotten hit? Um, or is everything that you do based on looking for FDA approval of, of specific drugs? Yeah, so so the you know uh, the answer is yes, absolutely, and maybe I can describe a little bit how we think about you know how we orient ourselves across uh, you know the different investment buckets because I think that's kind of what we're getting at. So yeah, that'd so be we great. invest. Yeah, so we invest in you know well three main buckets. Let me describe two here. So the first, the one we've been talking about, we we call disruptive life sciences innovators. These are the companies that are you know trying to get the first FDA approval or. Uh, of their first drug or, or, you know, a major drug in their pipeline. Right. So it, that, that's sort of what we've been focusing on here. I think, you know, what, what, what you're asking about is, is, you know, really the commercial, you know, universe and the way we characterize that Phil is we call it, you know, robust revenue and cash flow growth companies. And by our definition, robust, yes, re- I'm sorry, robust revenue and cash flow growth right. stories. Right. So um, that definition uh, encompasses the Pfizer's of the world, the Centines of the world, right. You know, both of which are, you know, discounted Pfizer actually cracked 40 for the first time in a long time this morning. Um, you can tell I'm paying attention to it because I know that. Um, <laughs> I'm following it as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So so absolutely, we pay attention to it. And, and you know, our view of investing in, in the large mega caps, Phil, is, is that um, you have to be opportunistic. So I'm not a buy and hold investor of all the large caps. I don't know that that strategy is the best one over time. But I, I think if you have if you have a, an alpha generating portfolio that it can in, invest in disruptive therapeutic companies complemented by dislocated uh, or, or okay. uh, dislocated value for large caps, we think in aggregate that portfolio makes sense. And if I can talk a little more about that, I, I maybe I can give a little more context. So. Um, but what's the percentage, think, what's percentage breakdown between disruptive and the dislocation with large caps? So it depends on the market. Large right? caps. So, uh, yeah. So, no, it, depend, it depends on the market environment, right? So uh, I've been doing this long enough, Phil, to, to have to learn the hard lesson that if I were to have a fixed ratio, um, I, I would be giving away an alpha opportunity, right? Well, I shouldn't. Yeah. I shouldn't dictate to the market, right? So. If every big pharma company crashes and is discounted, I'm going to buy them all. Yeah, that's an extreme example, but <laughs> I, I think you get where I'm going, right? I absolutely, think, yes, absolutely. You, you know, we have to take. You know, I think as a you know as a portfolio manager, as a market participant, I think we have to take what the market gives us. And so, you know, I'll take as many dislocated large caps as the market will give me. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I can make that a very large percentage of the portfolio. Oftentimes it doesn't happen that you get that many dislocations simultaneously and I end up with a handful of positions. So I'd say the default is I have a handful of these things. Maybe it's, you know, in the 50 stock portfolio, maybe it's half a dozen, something like that, plus or minus a few, you know, in an extreme market scenario, it can be sub- substantially higher than that. Um, you know, so for example, uh, pandemic lockdowns of, you know, first quarter 2020, um, it was substantially higher than that, um, in, in that moment in time. Uh, but again, that was, that was a unique time. So, um, if I could just talk a little bit about the, you know, the, our second bucket, you know, which I call these robust, um, you know, cash flow and revenue growth stories, um, or you could even reverse that robust cash flow. Um, it, so we think it's critical for, uh, an investor that, that focuses on disruptive therapeutics companies to pay a lot of attention to the second bucket, right? Because, you know, understanding the commercial performance of newly approved innovative assets keeps you grounded about how to value them before they get approved, right? And and I think where a lot of folks, you know, run into trouble um, that like to invest in innovative companies um, is that, you know, you you lose touch of, you know, what what a fair value is. And a fair value has to have, you know, some purview of what the actual cash on cash return potential is for these assets over time. Ultimately, if you can't, uh, you know, generate a cash on cash return in a commercial context for these assets, you know, that's that's a value destroying proposition that can't persist indefinitely. And and, you know, our you know, our 
from doing this, you know, since before the financial crisis, something we've really come to appreciate, Phil, uh, is that over short periods of time, you can see, you know, wide variation between the price of an asset and its underlying fundamentals or in, in fundamentals, again, by our definition of fundamentals, this broad encompassing definition. But over any meaningful period of time, those tend to converge. And and especially in the therapeutics space, right? Because if you think about what a therapeutic drug is and how it gets used, you know, we talked a lot about the regulatory approval. You have to get regulatory approval. If a drug doesn't have convincing medical benefit or evidence of medical benefit, it's not going to get over an approval bar. Okay, so now a drug's approved. If it doesn't have convincing medical benefit, a physician's not going to prescribe it. Um, you know how litigious medicine is, Phil. I mean, you know, you, you think you think large groups of physicians are going to pr pr uh, prescribe uh, drugs that are that are not clearly beneficial to patients, right? Um, and, and then the payer side, right? So, you know, if you're a payer, are, are you going to have a reimbursement policy that's right. constructive on a drug? So, you, you, the fundamentals wow. are 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 at every decision point in the value chain for healthcare. So, you know, and again, fundamentals by our definition of fundamentals, which are you know, you know, the maybe to put it simply, you know, the value of the medicine uh, to a patient. And and so, you know, maybe that's a long way of saying that absolutely you have to pay attention to the commercial landscape uh, because, you know, that's really the engine that's giving you feedback uh, about what's being valued in the marketplace. Love that. So, Mark, your fund alpha is parallels really well with, with your performance, right? When you look at your performance over the past three years, you've averaged like 19 and a half percent versus the category uh, six point seven three percent over a one year period, fifteen percent. The category being biotech, you know, and pharma, down negative five point six two. Your performance is really incredible. Why do you think that is? Yeah, no, thanks, Phil. So uh, you know, we, um, you know, again, I, I, I think it's as simple as if you can enrich your portfolio. For the companies that that have you know differentiated products that create clear value for patients, and you avoid you know obviously the snake oil. I, mean, I haven't talked about right. that, but we talked you know, about there's some that there's some snake oil salesmen out there, right? There's, some, there, there's a number of drug you know it's a small number, right? Look, I would say the industry as a whole is doing fantastic work, and there's a lot of really high quality scientists that are doing phenomenally exciting programs. But there's some snake oil salesmen in there. There are. It's not zero. Mm -hmm. And 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 these guys are you'd be surprised how compelling they can be. Um, so you got to avoid those. Right. Because those often, you know, go to zero and they they uh, unfortunately suck in a lot of equity dollars and they, you know, they wipe people out. And, and I've seen this, you know, over, you know, the 15, 16 years I've been doing this. It's sad to see. Uh, but so so you avoid those. And then, you know, there's admittedly there's a pretty fair sized group in the middle, Phil, where. It's not always that obvious, right? And that's where the battleground is. And so I feel like, you know, again, avoid the snake oil, capture a couple of the clear winners, and then in the battleground middle, you know, get your fair share. And, and look, everybody's going to take lumps in this space, right? There isn't a biotech investor alive that that hasn't had things go the wrong way, right? It, sure. It's not 100% predictive. But again, think about at the portfolio level, if you can just enrich this a portfolio, you know, we think you can deliver, you know, differentiated returns on a sustainable basis. Mark, how about an analyst? So th that's why where your expertise and your background and what you studied in back in, in school really comes to the forefront and helps you tremendously. It's a big reason why your alpha relative to, to your category is tremendous. How are Wall Street analysts in this particular category? When you read their reports, if you read their reports, do you think they're of quality and do you think they're helpful? Yeah, I, you know, I do. I think that there's, you know, there's a lot of smart folks out there that that do good work. Um, now, you know, I, I would say that, um, you know, there's there's can be a disconnect between best ideas and, you know, sort of uh, coverage that's for other reasons, you know, banking and whatever. Right. So you have to take a little bit of with a grain of salt, Phil, about, um, you know, you could have a very smart analyst that does very good work that, you know, might not be able to give consistent opinions across their whole coverage. Um, but but I, you know, look, I source ideas from, you know, from folks in in um, at banks occasionally. And, 
you know, I find that, you know, there is definitely high quality work. The, the trouble is, is that, you know, f you know, any individual analyst is going to have a, a, a limited coverage, right? How, right? how many stocks can analyst coverage? Exactly. 20? That's the right? problem. And, and, they, and they're covering and, more and more and more these days. Yeah, but but even then, right? That that's a very small footprint in the hundreds and hundreds of companies in the space. So any one analyst, Phil, can't answer the question what what he or she thinks are really the twenty best companies in the space right. because they're just not following enough of the you know the waterfront, right? So you know, I think it's up to a portfolio manager to so so maybe if I took the best idea from you know the ten smartest analysts, that could make sense, right? But I don't I don't think there is. I haven't seen any Wall Street analyst that is rolling up, um, uh, you know, across, you know, multiple different disease areas and categories of best ideas. I haven't seen that. Yep. I agree with you. Let's talk about risk. When I present to clients invest in this particular space, like for example, my core stocks that I manage for clients is, is really think Warren Buffett in terms of strategy and style based on free cash flow present value of future cash flows, estimates, you know, below intrinsic values, high returns on investment capital, products that you know and recognize and understand, strong leadership. So pretty simplistic, but yet it's it's a robust portfolio. That's the core on how I manage clients' monies. When you think about your strategy, which is in, you know, disruptive biotech slash pharma slash you know, healthcare, right? If a client says, you know, so that sounds risky. What is your answer to that? Yeah, so, look, I think that's a fair question. I get that one a lot. Um, well, first, I would say, you know, there's data that folks can can review. So, you know, look at look at the aggregate performance of the fund since its inception. And, you know, I'll tell you that, uh, you know, for example, in, in 2020, during the pandemic lockdowns, if I were to tell you our drawdown was half of the S&P 500's drawdown, that might that might make you think twice about what's risky, right? Yeah. Um, now, now, in fairness, you know, we operate in the biotech space. We we were kind of early to recognize COVID as something that was a risk factor, and you know, position the the portfolio you know accordingly. Um, but you know, suffice to say, right? You know that. Um, I guess what I would say, Phil, is that um, you know because we in, we in also invest. I, I think if this was a pure play, you know fund that invested in that first bucket of disruptive innovators, I would agree. And, and a portfolio like that. So I do manage a portfolio like that. And it is more volatile for sure. Um, but I think that if you have one that's complemented with, you know, that second bucket of, you know, more commercial stage companies that, you know, as they get dislocated, sort of, you know, kind of as you were describing, you know, a, a cash flow stream that's robust, as it gets dislocated, you get more interested to buy it. Right? I agree with that 100%. And, and, and that's not I don't think true. there's a lot and I don't think there's a lot of risk in something like that. Yeah, exactly. But that's not true for you know a disruptive innovator company right. where it could have the, a data set comes out and yeah, right. it's down fifty percent, but actually it's probably worth zero now. Right. And and you know, so so I think that you know those two things coexist in, in at least in our in our mutual fund portfolio right. to help balance that out, to right. help you know, allow folks to invest and have a chance at some upside for the disruptive innovators. We're having some protection. So, you know, a portfolio like that is sort of like a tweener, but I 100% get what you're saying, right? I mean, you know, you don't want to uh, be so far out on the risk curve, uh, you know, that, you know, you, you fall over the edge. I agree with that. And then finally, two more questions. This last big question is politics, the Inflation Act, right? So I was speaking to one of my clients about your fund actually in specific, and we're just talking in general about healthcare. And his concern is that, the pricing with drugs and everything that the Biden administration is looking to do. How does that affect your decision making as it relates to investing? Yeah, so so the Inflation Reduction Act is is clearly an incremental negative. It is, period, full stop. You know, I, I've written about it. Um, uh, I, you know, I write a weekly um, a markets blog for folks that are interested. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure I can get you signed up. But, you know, I, I actually coined it um, the uh, Innovation Reduction Act, Phil. So uh, <laughs> and, and, and since I wrote that, I've, I've seen I've seen that show up in a few other publications. I think it might have showed up in the uh, Wall Street Journal. Um, That's great. Uh, a, a CEO was interviewed um, that that you know sort of mentioned it, but um, so so let's talk about drug pricing. Let's talk about you know headwinds to that. So uh, the Inflation Reduction Act essentially allows uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS is the acronym, uh, to 
to they call it price negotiation. These are price caps, right? Let's just call it what it is, right? <laughs> the cap prices for certain drugs after a certain amount of time. So so here's here's the part that you know gets muddy fast. Certain drugs for a certain amount of time. Well, uh, which certain drugs is not so certain. <laughs> and so so it it, it cre- you know it adds to you know what I would describe as a Byzantine set of rules and labyrinths that you know, sort of uh, ultimately influence drug prices. And, and, and you know, clearly there's going to be some losers out of this. It's not everybody. And, and it's also going to create some opportunities. So, you know, we think that, you know, uh, from the, the macro level, it's a headwind, mostly for a few companies with large established products that are going to bear the most brunt of it in the near term. Um, it's a headwind for early stage companies that might be developing products that, would likely end up in the certain to be negotiated camp. Right. Okay. But, um, that's now do you have, now do you, I mean, do, do you have to, so how does that work in terms of your forecasting, right? So if you're in these disruptive businesses and it hits on it exactly the way you thought it was, gets the FDA approval and with the FDA approval, you're making some cash flow estimates of that particular business, right? So, yep. Yep. Now, in your models, are you modeling these discounts in in these on these drugs? Yeah. So you have to change your view of of you know really peak sales estimate, but more importantly, feel duration. Right. It's it's that mm-hmm. area under the curve. Right. And and you know I think most people get that if you do a discounted cash flow analysis of a you know of a disruptive therapeutic drug, you know a lot of that value is at the end of the curve. So whatever you do to cut off the end of that curve, you can materially change the present value. Right. So, so, but, but I guess what I was trying to describe about the inflation reduction act, Phil, is it doesn't affect every drug, right? It's going to be a small, a relatively small subset of all drugs that are out there. So in a way, you know, in, in some strange way, it actually favors an active manager, you know, because you have at least a chance to, to bob and weave around you know, the landmines that are, that are, you know, going to blow up a couple programs here and there. Wow, and that's so, really so, you know, look, it, it's, you know, again, in aggregate, it's, it's an incremental negative, doesn't affect every drug. It's going to affect certain drugs after a certain period of time. And that, you know, and the exact list of these things is not certain, right? So it, 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 it it's clear as mud. Um, but it provides opportunity, I think, for folks to to weave around it. And I think the other thing you're going to see is you're going to see big pharma's. Um, you know, they have another big reason to pursue M and A to augment pipelines because of Inflation Reduction Act, because they're the ones that are going to fo- uh, face, uh, you know, the biggest um, hit in terms of established large commercial products. You know, having those 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 tails cut off, that's going to hit the big pharma's. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. And finally, Mark, if you can't answer this from a compliance standpoint, it's not a problem. Can you give us your best idea as it relates to your disruptive um, bucket and your robust revenue and cash flow bucket? So can you give us your two best ideas? Is it possible? <laughs> uh, best idea is just buy the fun. And that way you, you get them both. That's that's fine. If you want to you want to leave it there, that's that's not a problem. Yeah, no, I, it, uh, hard for me to talk about individual stocks and best ideas. I mean, I, I, you know, what I like to do, Phil, is I can give some examples, um, you know, of things that have played out um, and, and holdings I've reported. Um, I, I've done that consistently. So I could just mention, too, just to give yeah. maybe folks a flavor for the Thank types you. of companies we own. So uh, on the on the disruptive, innovative side, you know, so, uh, you know, we own Syncor Pharma, ticker with CINC. Um, this was an interesting company developing an aldosterone synthase inhibitor for uh, kind of treatment resistant hypertension. And, um, you know, I encourage folks to look at the chart of this company. It's a, it's 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 a, a typical biotech story. Right. So real quick, the voiceover is company does an IPO, you know, with some fanfare, raises uh, you know quite a bit of capital from good investors. I didn't participate. I'm just watching at this point. Um, they release mid stage phase two data. Um, it's positive. Stock runs up. They do a follow-on offering. It's a billion six market cap company with a half a billion dollars in cash in the balance sheet at this point. And I'm looking wow. at it. And I'm saying it's interesting, but again, I'm I'm not involved. I'm just sort of watching from the sidelines, which is typical for me to do. I I watch a lot. You know, it's a couple hundred companies I watch from the sidelines every day, and you know, I sit there and I think, is today the day? And 99% of the time, the answer is no. Um, company announced 
another phase two data set, mixed data. This was at the end of last year. Stock goes through the floor. Momentum guys jump on. Weak hands that were in the IPO bailed. Weak hands from the follow-on offering bailed. Stock trades all the way down to below the value of cash. Wow. So wow. That's that's interesting. It you know went negative. It went below five hundred million dollars. They have five hundred million dollars of cash now. Oh my gosh. They, they're going to spend that five hundred million dollars of cash doing development work. So right. Right. It's, it's not completely uncommon for biotechs to go below cash value. It does happen, but usually not the ones that have five hundred million dollars cash. Usually the ones that have you know. Fifty million dollars of cash, right. and they're burning a hundred right. in the next year. Right, those are going negative. But um, so we, I bought my whole position when it was below five hundred million market cap. Um, and uh, January of the J.P. Morgan conference, um, uh, you know, AstraZeneca came in and acquired the company for over hundred percent premium. Oh my so, god! So, so th these are the types of things you see, right? So I, I think this That's is terrific. something that you know, you, you know, as a as a specialist, you know, I think. You know, uh, if I were to give anybody advice, you know, I'd say be very careful owning individual biotech stocks, right? Number one, very careful because you wake up any day and, you know, you yeah. know, hell can break loose. And you got to be ready to either double down or completely bail every day when you hold a stock like this. You have to be ready for that. Um, they, again, based on the fundamentals and how the, how the news flow changes. Um, but the other thing I would say is that, you know, if you're going to try to do fundamental work and get a point of view on a company, um, Typically, what people do is that they finish their work, they're all excited, and they want to buy it that day. And, and I ask people, Phil, like, okay, uh, what are the chances that the day you just happen to serendipitously finish your work is the right day to put a full position on in that stock? Right. Seems very unlikely, right, that right. those two events would, would coincide. So right. you need to – this is the hardest thing to do is you need to separ separate – you know, your fundamental work from actually, um, you know, uh, managing the position itself. It's emotional, and, aspect, right, in a way. And it's also, you know, it's just natural that, you, you know, you go through a process of doing a lot of work on something that you're excited about owning. You want to own it right away. I mean, I have right? it all, I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, I have a list of like 12 or 13 businesses that I'm so interested to own. And, you know, I, like you said, you kind of watch them on the sideline, watch them on the sideline, and, and you, but you're so itching to get in. But you just have to follow a discipline. Exactly. And and that's why, you know, you've had success, you know, you know, with your with your money management program. And, you know, I, I apply the same the same techniques, you know, in, in, in my niche, too, is that, um, you know, you have to be patient. And, you know, as part of our fundamental thesis driven approach, you know, we have fundamental defined entry and exit points as well. Yeah. Right. And, because I translate that into a price. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I miss it. Right. Yep. It happens. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you miss the disaster, too, or, or you you capture the disaster. So right. uh, let me give you one more quick example, Phil. So you asked about a, a robust um, revenue and cash flow growth company. And, and um, you know, a great example of this, uh, you know, I think the poster child would be Horizon Therapeutics. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So so Horizon Therapeutics was the, the biggest holding in the mutual fund uh, the day that Amgen announced it was acquiring the company. Um, and, yeah. You know, this was December. I think, we were, I think, we, I think you and I were, were talking on the phone at that time. Oh, yeah, no, I, I think yeah. we were. Yeah, we were, we were talking and then we were saying, oh, you know, Horizon. But, yeah. uh, you know, just, you know, the real quick version of Horizon, commercial stage company, um, you know, they were a, they were a primary care uh, drug business, Phil. And they, um, about five or six years ago, they started acquiring niche orphan drugs. Because they had a vision, you know, a corporate vision to remake their commercial business from one of primary care with, you know, challenged pricing environment, challenged margins. Like that was a declining business that they had. And, and they, they did a masterful job of, of focusing on high value, you know, orphan drugs, um, very limited therapeutic alternatives. You can have a much higher price and a much smaller commercial infrastructure, right? I mean – you know, you're charging a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, annualized therapy for, for some of these drugs. You know, think about how many patients you need to get versus, a, you know, a thousand bucks or a couple thousand buck a year, you know, mass market drug. Right? It's a, it's right. a different, you know, uh, uh, it's a different uh, operational uh, burn, uh, you know, a burden. Right. So the GNA, you know, the SGNA component of, of that business model is very different. But so so suffice to say, they went out and acquired, you know, some some interesting orphan drugs. They executed masterfully in growing these up to, you know, a revenue stream that was, you know, multi-billion dollar revenue stream that fit exactly um, in one of these revenue holes. In the case of Amgen, who's facing biosimilar competition for a lot of their, their leading franchises, 
um, it drops right in there. It maintains sort of the revenue base. Right. Uh, it was done at a price that's going to be accretive. Um, what's not to like? Everybody yeah. comes out ahead. And so uh, the funny thing was is that, you know, Horizon, if you actually, I encourage people to look at the chart, um, uh, the stock was really dislocated toward the back half of 2022. Uh, they had some uh, manufacturing uh, concerns or, or delays, um, which were minor in our view, but really hit the stock hard. And it, and it, and it drove it down to a valuation where Amgen could get to the table and say, hey, um, let's really talk about doing a deal. But um, I, I think, you know, that's that, that's a good example of what we look for. You, you know, again, uh, kind of exactly what you were saying about, you know, things you focus on. You know, we look at the cash on cash return potential of these businesses. And, and ultimately, if we don't think they can get there, um, it's going to be, you know, tough for us to be really excited about um, investing. Yeah. You listen, and I'll, and I'll end it with this. You were talk about discipline before. You know, I watched an interview with Einhorn, uh, you know, David Einhorn of um, Greenlight Capital, who I actually think is a phenomenal manager. He has a value discipline. And really, value has been out of favor for a while, and a lot, he lost a lot of clients. There's been a lot of withdrawals from his fund, and he talked about this in his interview. And last year, he was up 37%. I think going forward, I think he's going to crush it. But he, he was so humble about the experience of having a challenging time where the, 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 he didn't want to steer away from what he knew since he started in the business. And he stayed focused and disciplined where many value investors pretty much went out of business, right? But he talked about this idea of being disciplined, and that is the most important part as – what I do as a portfolio manager, what you do in your space and staying disciplined, staying on that sideline. And when you're ready, you're renting into a particular position. And that's what I really loved about you as well, is you had this discipline and process, which we know, Mark, is, is the number one thing. Once you let your emotions get involved and, and you move away from your discipline, that's when you're just done. It's like, then you're just done. You got to stick with your discipline, which is really the key to successful investing. So, Mark, I want to thank you for this very much. This is really, really excellent. You're doing a great job. We're looking forward to partnering with you as a firm. Um, we think your knowledge base is excellent. We think your process is, is phenomenal and your results show. So thank you for your time today. We appreciate it very much. Yeah, no, thank you, Phil. Great pleasure to be with you and look forward to uh, collaborating. All right, take care. Enjoy it, everybody. So I hope everybody enjoyed this current interview with Mark. Uh, you'll see it on the, the podcast uh, on YouTube shortly. So look forward to, to speaking to you soon.